So, guten Abend. Good evening to all of you. Bonsoir. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Weigel, thank you so much uh, for having me over, uh, having introduced me in the, uh, the way you did. And uh, I would like to thank everyone at the Munich European Board for this invitation. It's really an honor. And given the number of guest speakers who have preceded me, I'm humbled. Now, I would be remiss tonight if I didn't wish all of you, and particularly those of you who came with their spouse, a very happy Valentine Day. <laughs> now, I don't know what is your definition of a romantic evening, But I truly hope that you're looking forward to a good discussion on convergence within members of the European Union. If that doesn't match your definition of a romantic evening, you have a lot of common sense. <laughs> and I congratulate you. And you still have a chance to leave this room and do something else tonight if you wish. <laughs> so, in the name of love, there is another celebration, actually, that I would like to mention at this point in time. Because we are celebrating, this year, the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I wanted to ask you a question, which I will come back to at the end of my remarks. Was it a beginning? Was it an end? Was it a middle? Think about it. Think about it if you assume that a beginning is full of optimism. It's the promise of achieving something new. It's a bit like a, a newly born baby. A time when people are committed to make sure that the future is going to be greater than the past. It does ring a bell, doesn't it? Could have been the Berlin Wall fall. The ending. What's an ending? The ending could be the failure of a project, when nobody can actually pick up the pieces. But it could also be when your work hopefully has succeeded. Endings can be a time when an idea suddenly becomes a reality. Could be the fall of the Berlin Wall as well. And what about the middle? Well, the middle, it's about work in progress. It involves effort, hard work, sacrifice. It means finding common ground where no one seemed to exist. Well, here too, perhaps, is a good description of what the fall of the Berlin Wall meant to the whole of Europe and the world. So let's keep that question in mind. And when I conclude tonight, I hope we'll have found out what the answer is. Now, I want to begin with the theme of this year's conference, as was rightly reminded by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Liechtenstein, Europe works. Because despite well-known difficulties, Europe indeed has worked, worked, and works, much, much to the chagrin of some of the observers. And it is important to recognize success when there is success, and history actually matters, because you do not plant, cut flowers. Then once we've done a little bit of that, looking at the success that we've had, I would like to look at the next chapter of Europe's story, where Europe works as well. The challenges the European Union faces today require a commitment to the spirit of multilateralism and unity that created the EU in the first place. And that is particularly true of the area that I want to focus on, which is restarting economic convergence. That's what I want to talk about. And I will try to touch on some of the topics that you've mentioned, but I think the economic convergence is one of the foundations from which countries, people, are actually satisfied that there is something in it for them. 
and that, and that they have some control over their destiny. So first, a little history. Close your eyes. Imagine that we are in 1949, as you rightly indicated. Europe's economy is desperately trying to recover from the war. Millions of people are still unemployed. Hundreds of thousands of refugees languish in displaced persons camps. And in this city, many of the streets, the beautiful streets that you drove through this morning, are still strewn with rubble and destruction. Now fast forward 70 years. The European Union, comprising over half a billion citizens, is the second largest economy in the world. It is also the largest trading bloc in the world. In fact, if you include the countries with which the European Union just concluded free trade agreements, Japan, Canada, just recently Singapore, the trading bloc accounts for over one third of global GDP. And tomorrow, Mr. President, the city of Munich will actually host world leaders who will gather to collaborate on international security. So how did we get here? I would contend that it is through courage and creativity. The promise of the EU has always been both economic and political. Borrowing from the philosopher of the Enlightenment, who praised the virtue of trade. Don't forget Montesquieu, who used to say, là où il y a du commerce, il y a de bonnes mœurs. The founders of the European Union believed that the free flow of goods, services, investment, and people would lead to interconnected economies and in turn, widely shared prosperity and peace. This promise has largely delivered. From the 40s and 50s, when the Marshall Plan helped rebuild a war-torn continent, to the transition from dictatorships to democracies, remember the Salazar and the Franco and the Connells, to the fall of the Iron Curtain and the economic transformation of Eastern European, European countries in the 90s. It has delivered. Two of the most historic steps in realizing the vision of a united Europe were, number one, the creation of the single market, and number two, the euro. And here, Germany played a unique and defining role. As Dr. Weigel famously said, I quote you if you don't mind, Theo, Germany brought the Deutsche Mark into Europe and in so doing, brought the euro into being. So that whole history has a common theme. The marriage of political and economic fortunes is an incredibly difficult but worthwhile endeavor. Probably as laborious to build as it is perilous to disentangle as we are seeing at the moment. But it can only work when all of Europe is successful. And that is the point that I want to make in the second part of my remarks. It's that of economic convergence. As obscure as that may sound, it's actually critical for the whole of Europe to succeed. Because if you had divergence as opposed to convergence, and if a group of the member states thrive while another group languish that's where the seeds of divisions are likely to damage the construction that has been elaborated over the course of the last decades. Now, what does that word mean, convergence? What is it? Put simply, it means poorer countries' incomes catch up to their wealthier neighbors. Think about the last 20 years. During this period, the promise of EU membership for former communist countries 
led to market-driven reforms and institution building that unleashed their economic potential. From 1995 to 2007, real income per person nearly doubled in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, and in Slovenia. It increased by more than two and a half times in the Slovak Republic, in Estonia, and in Poland. And it more than tripled in Latvia and Lithuania. Now clearly, it took many parents to brew that success. But the IMF was certainly proud to play a part, and I'm sure Klaus Regling, who is with us tonight, who was a member of our institution in those days, played his part too. In fact, at the time, we created a new lending instrument specifically designed to address the needs of the former communist countries. And all IMF members, including in particular the United States, playing a key leadership role at the time, supported that. The reforms that new member states implemented in order to join the EU made them an attractive place for the original EU members to invest. And as a result, Europe's economies have become deeply integrated, as we see, for some of those companies that are preparing for a potential Brexit. Because significantly and highly sophisticated Euro supply chains were built as a result of that construction. The dedication of the new member states has paid dividends for all EU member and proves the point that solidarity actually served self-interest. What worked for the Czech Republic, what worked for Slovakia, actually worked for Germany as well. From the mid-1990s to 2007, New member states' real income per person doubled, and the original EU member grew at only 42% increase. So that convergence was in train. But the global financial crisis put a pause on Europe's progress. And that convergence took a back seat to what? To survival. The European Union, rightly so, united to save itself. But the need for convergence did not go away. And now we must focus on it once more. Why? Because Europe is once again facing a defining moment. Over the last few years, populist movements have called into question the fundamental value of integration. Migration from the Middle East and North Africa has sparked concerns over cultural identity, security, and the sense of collective destiny. The rules-based global trading order, a key source of global growth over the past 70 years, is facing unprecedented pressure. And the continent's next generation, which is still suffering from the economic war scars of the global financial crisis, is searching for quality jobs and a stable future. One in four young people in the European Union are now at risk of being in poverty. One out of four. Solving these challenges requires a renewed commitment to shared prosperity in Europe. And there are signs of that renewed momentum. If we want to see those signs, not if we're distracted by constant headlines. Daily, the EU is reminding the world that it proudly supports free and fair trade, defends multilateralism, and seeks ways to reduce the inequality fueling so much of our discord. And it brings to mind the words of Chancellor Kohl, who said, we all need Europe, not just those of us in Europe. And right now, in a world that is questioning the value of international cooperation, the world needs Europe more than ever. But first of all, Europe needs to succeed at home. And for that to happen, Europe needs to 
rekindle economic convergence where it has faltered. In contrast to the continued convergence of Central and Eastern European member states that has progressed and has brought those countries to good standards, convergence between Southern and Northern Euro area countries started to stall over the last 20 years. And since the crisis, the situation has only gotten worse. Between 2008 and 2017, so over the last 10 years, for the five southern Euro area countries hit hardest by the crisis, and by that I mean Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, and Cyprus, average annual growth in real income per person was actually negative. Not to mention the number of talented people who actually left those countries, as uh, the leader of the Greek opposition, as I still call it for this moment, uh, was reminding us earlier today. So our goal should be clear, restarting convergence and ensuring that the fruits of economic growth are shared broadly across the EU. This will help restore faith in the European project. IMF research has shown that product and labor market reforms can have significant impact on productivity, especially in those poorer countries that need to converge. Will not be easy, but just as with every difficult undertaking since the war, the hard work will help deliver long-lasting peace and prosperity. Let me mention only three, but three areas where progress needs to be made where results will come about and where productivity can be significantly improved, which will mean better convergence, better job situation for those in search of such. We can learn from previous commission presidents, and I here would like to quote Jacques Delors, who said, the European model is in danger if we obliterate the principle of personal responsibility. So Europe needs to work, but within Europe, each and every member has to also make sure that its house is in order, that reforms are undertaken, and that its own economy actually works. So the three kinds of reforms that we certainly advocate and that we believe can help fix this gap is number one, labor markets. If you look at the southern states. Unemployment there is far too high, especially for young people. In Italy, Greece and Spain, overall unemployment is between 10 and 20 percent, but for young people it's over 30 percent. Compare that to northern Euro area countries like Germany or the Netherlands, where overall unemployment is below 4 percent and youth unemployment less than 7 percent. Now, you will say, what are the factors? Clearly, lack of investment in education and proper training plays a part. But we also believe that the issue of flexibility plays a significant part. Too many companies face undue burdens when it comes to contracting, to hiring and firing. And addressing these challenges can actually help unleash the potential of many of those young people. Let me give you one example of a country that has taken those measures and where it has clearly delivered. Portugal. So it's not a northern wealthy country. It's Portugal. Recent labor market reforms gave business greater flexibility and as a result companies are now more willing to take a chance on new hires and offer them not fixed term contract. No. Permanent contract instead of those temporary ones that were used by Portugal businesses in order to protect against the, bureaucrat the bureaucratic process by which firing was possible or not. So reforms are actually working. The second area where clearly reform has to take place is on the business climate. Here again, we have seen progress in Portugal where in the mid-2000 years it used to take a month to start a business. Now it takes five days. There's much more than can be done. In many other southern Euro area countries, there is ample room to remove some of the barriers. 
Let me just mention one stumbling blocks for investment, and that will surprise some of you. It's bankruptcy law. The standard vary widely across Europe. Resolving a corporate insolvency in Greece, with due apologies, takes about nine times longer than in Ireland, for example. Nine times longer. Modernizing and harmonizing insolvency regime will help increase investment and create new jobs. But it will not only do that, it will also help create a European security market which is badly needed. Alternative to, apologies to bankers tonight, but to financing from the banks is to have a deep security market. It will only exist properly and easily in Europe once insolvency regimes will have been harmonized, and it should. Third and last one, investing in innovation. Again, major differences here. Research and development spending in Italy, Portugal, and Spain averaged just over 1% of GDP between 2000 and 2014. That amount to less than half the level of research and development spending in either of Germany or France. So boosting innovation is going to require a lot of reforms, including facilitating venture capital financing, impro improving public-private cooperation on research and development. But the impact can be significant. For example, in Italy, improving firms' access to financing for innovation and expanding public support for R&D could actually raise GDP by 5% over the long run. What does that mean for people? Well, it means an additional 2,000 euros per year in the average worker's real income in Italy. So I've just mentioned those three areas because we are certain that they actually work and they can deliver. Even in Portugal, even in Greece, I'm sure. And hopefully in Italy. Labor market reforms different climate for business, and financing innovation. The EU can help implement reforms through technical assistance, through advice. It can also devote more resources to supporting reforms and innovation in the next EU budget. And perhaps more importantly, the EU can continue to foster cooperation between countries while ensuring that no new barriers are built between them no new barriers built between them. We're seeing way too many barriers in the area of trades, which is a topic that we will be discussing in the next few days. But at least within the European Union, the Commission should be careful that no such barriers are built. And the whole discussion that is going on about competition rules within the EU is going to be a very good indicator of whether or not the European nations are prepared to actually consider those proposals of eradicating barriers. By building bonds of trust between member states, the EU can accelerate progress on a whole range of politically difficult undertakings. From a better European economic architecture, which is something that we have been advocating for quite a while, to meeting the crucial commitments of the Paris Climate Accord, to protecting individual rights to privacy, and to having ownership of a personal data, or to facilitating compensation of the use of such personal data, as was just recently decided in Coreper yesterday, Europe can actually demonstrate that there is an other way, and one that is protecting of individuals, facilitating business across member states, and constitu constituting a strong foothold of those principles and values that actually laid the ground for the constitution of the European Union 70 years ago. So let me now return by way of conclusion to my original question. Was the fall of the Berlin Wall a beginning, a middle, or an end? I would argue that it was all three. It was a time of new hope, culmination of 30 years of work, and it was also a challenge 
to rebuild. And I think the same is true in the Eurozone. And the same is true in Europe. It is a time that requires courage and creativity in the face of those new challenges that we're facing, the technological breakthroughs that operate both as opportunity and as threat, the cyber vulnerability that exists in many corners of Europe and beyond, the populism that we see and the massive migrations that we should expect. Tonight I've quoted uh, French, Delors, German European leaders, and in the spirit of unity and with all due respect to the process that they're going through, unfortunately, I would like to quote Churchill. He was in, he was out, he was in, he was out, but he was strong, wasn't he? So he said, this is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. If the European Union draws on its roots and finds a way forward towards shared prosperity, I believe that it will be solidarity that serves self-interest. And I believe that when we look back at 2019, it will be the start of an optimistic new chapter in the European story. We might be darkened, we might be negative, we can be pessimist about what is coming up. But we should have the pride that the European founders had when they overcome many more decades of trouble, of war, of hatred, and decided to rebuild. This is not as bad now. So let's get on with it. Thank you. Alles gut, ja. Ähm, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, herzlichen Dank für diesen Valentinsvortrag. <lacht> ein kleines Geschenk. Ähm, Theo Weigel hat mich gezwungen, nein, gebeten, ein Geschenk äh, zu machen. Ich habe das gerne übernommen. Bayern und Frankreich hat eine ganz besondere Verbindung. Äh, Bayern hat sein Königstum erst damals bekommen, als er sich auf die Seite von Napoleon geschlagen hat. Gut, Bayern hat sein Königreich auch behalten, als er sich dann wieder auf die andere Seite geschlagen hat. Ähm, wir sind da flexibel, wenn es Erfolg bringt, aber ähm, die Nähe und die Freundschaft ist geblieben. Deswegen als kleines Geschenk heute den Bayerischen Löwen für Sie als Erinnerung an den heutigen Abend. Thank you very much. Nice